Hello and welcome to this um, talk entitled, I Don't Understand Aging, Hearing Loss and Dementia. My name is Dr. Sarah Esther Cater and I am an audiologist at Old Bridge Medical Center, uh, part of Hackensack Meridian Health. And this talk is part of our celebration this month of May, which is Better Hearing and Speech Month. If you can grab a pencil and paper, there's just one part of the talk where you might wanna jot down some of your own answers to some questions. So that's what I mean by be ready to write. Just to outline what I'm gonna be talking about today. So first I wanna talk a little bit about hearing loss and aging. And my expertise is on the hearing loss aspect of this, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about dementia. Then we'll focus on how dementia and hearing loss interact and even answer the question or at least postulate some theories about why hearing loss and cognitive impairment coexist. And then we're gonna end with some practical, what can we do about it? Talking about treatment as far as hearing aids, memory program, et cetera. So when we talk about hearing loss and aging, we know that hearing loss is the third most common chronic health condition in older Americans. 40% of us will have hearing loss at age 65, and that number rises quickly to 80%, more than 80%, that have hearing loss at 80 and older. Of course, that does mean that there are people 80 and older, 20%, who actually have normal hearing. So not everybody who is older has hearing loss, but hearing loss becomes very common. Even though those numbers are so high, we also know that only 12.3% of um, adults, older adults, will have a hearing screening during their physical. So what is hearing loss? I think that we all think back to the days, maybe in school or maybe some other time where we had to listen to the beeps and raise our hands um, when we heard it. But hearing beeps and determining how loud the beeps have to be in order to for the patient to hear them is really only a small part of the story because audiometric thresholds, the level at which you can hear a beep, doesn't really reflect communication difficulties always. So hearing difficulty in the presence of multiple talkers with competing noise can even be present in people with normal hearing. So they might be able to hear all the beeps at a normal level, but when there's a lot of people talking, when there's noise in the background, they still might have trouble. And let's get a little bit semantic about it. Let's talk about listening versus hearing. So hearing is more passive. I hear the sound, whereas listening is active because listening refers to the act of making a conscious effort to perceive sound. And, and hearing is more the act of perceiving sound through your ear. So hearing does not require conscious effort, but listening does, making listening voluntary and hearing involuntary. So here's where I wanted you to grab some pen and paper. And I thought that maybe we could just have everybody go through and you can fill this out for yourself or maybe you have a family member that you're worried about their hearing. You can fill it out your perception about what they experience or maybe you have a patient, whoever, whatever your relationship is. So this is a, a screening called the Hearing Handicapped Inventory for the Elderly. Elderly is also valid for people who are not elderly. And you're gonna answer each question with yes, sometimes, or no. And I'm just gonna ask you, if you avoid a situation because you have hearing loss, don't skip the item, just that's a yes. Okay, so question number one. Just again, jot down yes, sometimes, or no. Number one, does a hearing problem cause you to feel embarrassed when you meet new people? Number two, does a hearing problem cause you to feel frustrated when talking to members of your family? Not frustrated just because of your members of your family, but the hearing problem causing you to feel frustrated. Number three, do you have difficulty hearing when someone speaks in a whisper? Yes, sometimes or no. Number four, do you feel handicapped by a hearing problem? Number five, 
Does a hearing problem cause you difficulty when visiting friends, relatives, or neighbors? Number six, does a hearing problem cause you to attend religious services less often than you would like? Number seven, does a hearing problem cause you to have arguments with family members? Number eight, does a hearing problem cause you difficulty when listening to TV or radio? Or a podcast, anything you like to listen to? Number nine, do you feel that any difficulty with your hearing limits or hampers your personal or social life? And number 10, does a hearing problem cause you difficulty when in a restaurant with relatives and friends? And I know not all restaurants are created equal in the, in, when it comes to communication and noise um, and food, but just choose average. Okay, so we have 10 questions and you have yes, sometimes, or no. Now you can go through and score your answers. So for every yes, you score yourself four points. For every no, get no points. And for sometimes you get two points. And then you add up all your points and you'll get a raw score. Now, what do we do with that raw score? Well, there's two things we can do with it. One thing is we can use that number to kind of predict how likely it is that you or the person you filled it out with them in mind has hearing loss. So if the score is zero to eight, there's only a 13% probability that there's hearing loss. If the score is 10 to 24, there's a 50% probability of hearing loss. If the score is 26 to 40, there's an 84% probability of hearing loss. That's one thing we can do. Another thing we can do is we can say, how much is your hearing problem affecting you? So some people can have, can have two patients with identical hearing loss, one is very affected by the hearing loss. It really bothers them. It really causes them difficulty. And the other person has the same hearing loss and yet they function fine. It doesn't affect them so much. And that's the handicap. So again, if your score is zero to eight, we would expect not much handicap at all. 10 to 24, mild to moderate handicap and 26 to 40, severe handicap. So that's just a little score, a little, a little screening to see kind of where you fall. Okay, now I'd like to talk a little bit about, a little bit more about how hearing loss makes you feel. Um, I get to talk to patients often about their hearing loss and the feelings that they, um, that they experience. Unfortunately, this is not a live audience, so I can't ask you for how hearing loss makes you feel, but I often hear lots of different answers and people talk about feeling lonely and feeling frustrated and feeling old. So there's lots of different feelings that people experience from their hearing loss, but really the, the term and the expression and the feeling that I hear about the most is frustration. Really almost every person will talk about being frustrated. The patients talk about being frustra frustrated. Their families talk about being frustrated. And we, but we also know that we can see sadness, depression, worry, anxiety, paranoia, emotional turmoil, and insecurity. Um, here's a little infographic, and it has eight consequences of untreated hearing difficulties. So number one is that your mental sharpness suffers. So untreated hearing impairment can put you anywhere between 29 and 57% greater risk of cognitive impairment. We're gonna talk more about that as we go along. Um, we're also gonna talk about how hearing loss doubles your risk of developing dementia. Number three, untreated hearing loss actually can impair your memory. Number four, conversations are just not as fun. And of course, as a corollary to that, number five, your social life may suffer. So seniors with untreated hearing loss are 20 to 24% less likely to participate in social activities. Their hearing loss may make them feel anxious and insecure. There's been a lot of research in the last few years about auditory fatigue and how tiring it is to listen when you have a hearing loss. So somebody might be managing fine, but they're working so hard to fill in the blanks, to figure out what people are saying, to guess, to really make educated 
decisions and it, it can be really exhausting. And actually number eight, all of these, because of all of these things, um, untreated hearing loss can actually impact your earning potential as well. There's no guarantee on that one. I can't promise, but it can. We also know that hearing loss has been associated with lots of different um, medical conditions. And this little graphic kind of talks about some of those. So um, hearing loss and cardiovascular disease are definitely linked. And maybe when we see hearing loss, we need to check for cardiovascular disease. Alzheimer's and dementia, which is really the topic of our, of our talk today. Diabetes, another talk that I have. Um, hospitalizations are 32% more likely for older adults with hearing loss. Excuse me, even mortality. So hearing loss is tied to a greater risk of dying specifically for older men. Chronic kidney disease is associated with a 43% increased risk of hearing loss. Falls, hearing loss tied to a threefold risk of falling and depression. Symptoms go down, quality of life goes up with hearing aid use. So how would you know that you have hearing loss? And also corollary to that, how would your physician know? Physicians think they know when patients have hearing loss, but actually only one out of 84 medical textbooks even mentions hearing loss. And asking a patient if they have hearing loss is only somewhere between one and 51% accurate. Even bedside screenings are not that accurate. So five to 61% accuracy on a screening done in your doctor's office. That probably, that big variation is probably related to kind of the variety of screenings. Remember starting at job once and as an audiologist, and I had a physical as part of the, um, the entrance to that job. And um, I, I really had to laugh when the physician who was examining me walked across the room eight feet and said, can you hear me? Whispered to me. And um, that was his hearing screening. So obviously that's not gonna be the most accurate hearing screening. Um, maybe screening with an actual test would be a little bit more sensitive. Hearing loss is both underdiagnosed and undertreated. 9% of internists offer hearing tests for patients aged 65 years and older, and 25% of hearing impaired older patients who could benefit from hearing aids use them. So when we think about this really low number of people that are having hearing tests, Medicare does have a recommendation that when you enter Medicare, your hearing should be screened. Again, what kinds of screening is kind of left up to the physician. And hearing loss is undertreated. So this um, graphic looks at different degrees of hearing loss. So when we look at hearing loss, we talk about how severe it is. So we have 75% of people with hearing loss fall in the mild to moderate hearing loss range. 20% fall in the moderate to severe range and only 5% um, fall into the profound range or sometimes we call it residual hearing because they just have a little bit left. And when you look at those groups, and you look at how many of them have hearing aids, you see something else. When you look at the profound group, 70% of those patients do have hearing aids and probably the 30% who don't, um, don't because their hearing aids don't help them at all. Or perhaps culturally they've decided to rely on sign language and not hearing aids. When you look at the moderate to severe range, 50-50. So these are people that really have very poor access to speech, yet only 50% of them. Um, use hearing aids. And when you look at the mild to moderate population, only 10%. We're going to come back to that mild to moderate population at the end when we talk about hearing aids and we'll touch also on the news with over-the-counter aids as well. So hearing aid adoption, how many people use hearing aids? Hearing loss affects millions. One in eight people in the United States age 12 years or older has hearing loss in both ears based on a hearing test. 28.8 million US adults could benefit from using hearing aids and men are twice as likely as women to have hearing loss among adults age 20 to 69. When we look at adults age 70 or older with hearing loss, who could benefit from hearing aids? Fewer than one in three has ever used them. 
And that's a pretty low number. Why? Let's talk about some of the barriers to treatment. First of all, a lot of people who have hearing loss don't know that they have hearing loss. So there's a lack of recognition that their hearing loss exists. Second, there's a perception that hearing loss is a normal part of aging. Well, if you, by normal, you mean that it's fairly common, that is true. But if by normal, you mean that it's something you need to accept and live with, that is not true at all. Um, and then there's the fact that even sometimes patients who do have hearing aids don't, or are recommended to have hearing aids, don't buy them or don't use them. And there's a lot of different reasons, stigma, cost, inconvenience, disappointing initial results, and there are some other factors. Here's a survey that looked at adults ages 35 to 65 years who had hearing loss and asked them, why don't you wear hearing aids? 35% say they don't want to admit that they have hearing loss in public. I often tell my patients, and another 30, again, 35% said that they were too noticeable. I often tell my patients, you may think that hearing aids are noticeable and they're not very noticeable today, but you may think that they're noticeable, but you know what's even more noticeable? When you can't hear. So trust me, the people around you are realizing when you say, hmm, I didn't get that, or trying to guess, they're noticing. But yet 34% of people are too embarrassed to wear their hearing aids. 31% think that hearing aids make them look disabled and old. 29% are too proud to wear their hearing aids. 29% think people will make fun of them or treat them differently. 26% think that hearing aids make you look weak and feeble. 22% say that they think people will treat them differently and think that mentally they are slow. All right, let's um, pause for a moment and talk a little bit about dementia. And I don't claim to be an expert in dementia. I'm really talking primarily about the overlap, but just wanna talk about a little bit of some of the statistics. 4.7 million Americans over age 65 have cognitive impairment. So there's a 10% prevalence that is estimated. And that means that one in four people, think about the group attending this, this talk today, one in four of us knows somebody with the disease and one in 10 has a relative with the disease. 60 to 80% of long-term care residents, so that means people in nursing homes, other long-term facilities have dementia. Yet, only half of the people who actually have dementia are diagnosed, and only half of those diagnosed, so that means a quarter of the total, receive treatment. This is a Lancet Commission um, model that talks about some of the risk factors for hearing loss. And what it does is it divides the risk factors, look at the bottom right corner, into potentially non-modifiable risk, risk factors, so risk factors that you can't really do anything about, and potential, potentially modifiable risk factors. And there are 35% of the risk factors for dementia that are things that we may be able to do something about. Well, that sounds good. If we look at early life, um, there is a gene that perhaps um, can be um, um, avoided with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or something like that. Um, and um, that is one 7% um, risk fact, 7% have that risk factor, um, we can reduce the risk that way. 8% less education. So when we take our children and we send them to school and they say, why do we need to learn this? One of the reasons is because the more education that you need to get, the more education that you have, um, that decreases your risk for dementia later in life. I'm gonna skip down to the later in life ones. And these are kind of the things that even when you're at the age where dementia is diagnosed, you can still do something about it. And that is smoking, depression, physical inactivity, social isolation, and diabetes. All things that increase your risk for dementia and something that you can do something about. And now let's go to the midlife. 
um, factors, and those are obesity, hypertension, and hearing loss. What's really interesting is that hearing loss actually has 9%, which is the highest percentage reduction in new cases of dementia if the risk is eliminated. So for hearing loss, um, compared to all the other modifiable risk factors, that we can have the biggest impact by treating hearing loss. Okay, so now let's talk about hearing loss and dementia together. So just overall, dementia is more common among people with untreated hearing loss. People with untreated hearing loss tend to develop cognitive decline earlier than peers with normal hearing. People with untreated hearing loss report more concerns about their memory than people with normal hearing. Let's look at some of the symptoms. So. First, let's look at some symptoms of dementia. And for each of these, you see there's a reference of a study that showed this. So with dementia, there was increased social isolation, decreased comprehension, inability to understand, repeating questions, short-term memory problems, stereotyped inappropriate word use, so using words in, in an inappropriate way, and some difficulty following conversation. Symptoms of dementia. Now look what happens. We can put right next to that symptoms of untreated hearing loss. And again, different studies, but found similar things for this other diagnosis of untreated hearing loss. So, so social isolation again, decreased understanding, repeating questions, working memory problems, stereotyped inappropriate word use, and difficulty following conversation. Fascinating. So two things. Dementia is more prevalent in patients with hearing loss, and hearing loss is more prevalent in patients with dementia. Let's look at some of the research that looked at that. First of all, there was a study that looked at self-perception of hearing loss, and it looked at how much hearing loss did you have to have in order to notice it? And it looked at two different groups. It, looks at, it looked at hearing loss in the mid frequencies. So that would be sounds like P's, T's, K's, G's, and then high frequency hearing loss. So that would be more sounds like S, F, T, H, S, H. And it found that if your hearing loss in the mid frequencies was at around 16 decibels, give or take 10, um, you had a likelihood to deny that you had any problem. Whereas if you had a hearing loss in the 23 decibel range, then you probably would notice it. With higher frequency hearing loss, you actually needed to have more hearing loss to notice it. So even if your hearing loss was as poor as 33 decibels, there was a tendency to deny hearing loss. And however, once it reached like 46 decibels, then you would notice it. And when we look at, take that study together with um, this information, and we look at whether you noticed your hearing loss and whether you noticed a trouble with hearing. And what we see is that this last group over here, those with more high frequency hearing loss had a real tendency to also notice cognitive dysfunction. Here we look at an adjusted odds ratio. So how much more likely are people with hearing loss to have dementia? And we see that they are more likely, even with mild hearing loss, 1.5 times more likely to have dementia, but also that as the hearing loss get worse, the odds of having dementia get become greater. So with moderate, mild hearing loss, it was a 1.5, adjusted odds ratio, moderate hearing loss, 2.2 adjusted odds ratio, and moderately severe, 4.1 adjusted odds ratio. And what they did in the study was they did adjust that odds ratio for some other factors, family history of dementia, depression diagnosis, their number of medications, lots of different things, and they still were able to show this very clearly. And the uh, reference for that is in the lower right-hand corner. Now let's look at it the other way. Let's look at patients who were already diagnosed with dementia. So this study by Weinstein and her colleagues um, looked at 
patients who already had a dementia diagnosis. So this was an institutionalized elderly population, probably in a nursing home. And they reviewed all the patients with a dementia diagnosis. 83% of them had at least mild hearing loss. Here was another study that looked at patients in a memory disorder clinic. 52 patients, 30 had a probable Alzheimer's disease diagnosis, 22 had other cognitive impairments. And then they screened their hearing. 49 of the 52 failed the hearing screening. So hearing loss is much more common when we look at older individuals with memory disorders than in the general population of adults. There's another um, very interesting factor. So one of the tools that is very commonly used in dementia diagnosis is a test called the Mini Mental State Exam Examination, MMSE. And it's very commonly used, used by 77.1% of psychiatrists and 90% of primary care physicians that are screening for dementia in their offices. This is what the test looks like. So it's not a very long test, it's just a screening. Um, and it asks some questions to the patient. It asks them if they know what, where we are, date, time, day of the week. Um, it asks for some memory questions. Um, it asks um, them to repeat a phrase, no ifs, ands, or buts. It asks them to copy a picture. There's a problem with this test. The problem with this test is that people who don't hear well have poorer scores on the MMSE. And so that means that they can end up with either a misdiagnosis or more commonly with a diagnosis of more se severe dementia than they truly have. And this study, Jorgensen colleagues, uh, simulated hearing loss into five groups. The, there are four um, hearing tests pictured here. Those were four of the groups. And then the, the fifth one was normal hearing. And using these, fake audiograms, they were able to calculate what percent of speech sounds patients with this type of hearing loss would have access to and how that would affect their scores. And what they found was that patients who had high speech intelligibility index scores, so in other words, they were able to hear most of the speech sounds, 0.99 out of one, right? They could hear most of them. They, had a most, they were most likely to have normal cognition on the test maybe some mild dementia. Patients who had 0.42, so a little less than half of access on their speech intelligibility index, still most likely to have normal cognition, maybe some mild or moderate dementia. But once the scores fall even lower, you start to see more and more dementia correlated with the hearing loss. This study by Jorgensen took 100 patients and of those patients reviewed their charts, 13 patients of the 100 were asked if they had hearing loss. These are patients who were uh, being evaluated for dementia. So they're having their initial evaluation to see if they have dementia. 13 of the 100 patients they looked at were even asked if they had any hearing problem. Um, of those patients who were asked, three of them said, yes, I do have hearing loss, and 10 said, I do not. 87 patients were not even asked. Six of those did have hearing loss. 81 had never been diagnosed or reported hearing loss. And of the six who had been diagnosed with hearing loss, two had hearing aids and four did not report hearing aids. Okay, one more study. So hearing loss and dementia diagnosis. This is again an institutionalized elderly population. Um, reviewed the charts, 83% had at least mild hearing loss. And here's what they did. They retested their mental status, but this time they gave them a personal amplifier, a little device that just made things a little bit louder, like a microphone. And they redid the test that they had been given. Maybe it was the MMSE. And they found that 33% of patients were reclassified to less severe dementia. So it really made a difference for them to hear the test better, which makes perfect sense. What can we do about it? Well, one thing is maybe we need to start using different tests. This test is called the MOCA, stands for Montreal Cognitive Assessment, and it is much less affected by hearing. 
It's one thing we can do. Um, another thing we can do is when we are diagnosing patients with a diagnosis of dementia, we can make sure to check their hearing first and address their hearing loss before we lock in that diagnosis and the severity of the, um, of the cognitive disorder. All right, so, so far, I think what we've proven and what we see over and over again in the studies is that hearing loss and dementia coexist. But coexisting, a lot of things coexist, and it doesn't mean that one causes the other. It doesn't even mean that one affects the other. They just might both be present. Maybe there's more. So why do hearing loss and dementia coexist? And there are three theories. The first theory is the cascade hypothesis. Second one is called the common cause hypothesis. And the third is common burden, cognitive burden. Just wanna talk about those briefly. The cascade postulate is that prolonged reduction in hearing function leads to insufficient stimulation. I can't hear and therefore I'm not being stimulated. That auditory deprivation cascades into decreased social interactions, impoverished cortical sensory input. We are not stimulating the brain. And the decreased interactions cascade into cognitive decline. So it's a little cycle. We have the inability to communicate successfully. And because of that, it's not very much fun to participate because there's a low reward. And because of that, there's withdrawal from social activities. Susan Pinker has a TED talk and she talks about the secret to living longer. And guess what the number one factor that is a secret to living longer? Social integration. And I wanna talk now about so social isolation a little bit and, and its effects. So there was a health omnibus survey, survey in, in um, Southern Australia, and they looked at the likelihood of self-perceived social isolation and they saw that it increases with the number of chronic conditions. So if you have a lot of stuff going on, you're more likely to be socially isolated, okay? That makes sense. They also found that the strongest association with social isolation was depression. Sure, if you're feeling depressed, you're not getting out of bed to go anywhere. But the second um, strongest correlation was with self-reported hearing difficulties. So hearing impaired older adults are at increased risk of experiencing emotional distress and restrictions in social engagement after five years. Hearing ability and noise is significantly associated with incident social and emotional loneliness. Self-perceived hearing handicap and difficulty understanding distorted speech relate to loneliness and social isolation. Finally, emotional loneliness increases with hearing decline among per persons who have recently lost a life partner. Hearing aid use has a protective effect. So those who use hearing aids, we don't see it as much, but only among non-hearing aid users does poorer hearing lead to more loneliness. Okay. And finally, also with the cascade postulate, um, Maharani and um, Dawes and Nasru found a decline in episodic memory. So memory skills were declined and that led to um, more cognitive decline, a higher rate of cognitive decline for people with hearing loss um, and less a slowing in the rate of that decline once they began to use hearing aids. So, when we look at modifiable risk factors for dementia, we know that we can improve the risk for dementia if we increase social isolation. And we know that we can increase social isolation by providing help for hearing aids, with hearing aids. So second theory is the common cause postulate. Common cause postulate says that maybe one doesn't cause the other but maybe the loss of input from hearing loss combined with cognitive decline from dementia are coming from the same neurodegenerative process in the aging brain. So as we get older, some common cause is causing some degeneration in the brain and that is affecting both hearing impairment and cognitive decline. 
Unfortunately, according to that hypothesis, hearing aids may not affect cognition because if we're seeing an overall common cause, then we might not see any improvement. Thought this was a cute little picture that talks about cognitive burden, brain overload. And we all experience this sometimes that when we are trying to do too many things at once, each task becomes difficult. So if we give somebody um, difficulty with hearing and difficulty with cognition together, we're going to see more difficulty. And we can think about it this way. Listening effort, how hard I have to work in order to listen is gonna be affected by these three factors. The um, motivation, so do I want to hear my spouse telling me to take the garbage out? Cognitive demand, is somebody boring me like I am with lots of statistics and dry information? Um, and acoustic challenge. Let's talk a little bit about what acoustic challenge means. So acoustic challenge has three specific aspects. We have acoustic challenge to the listener, to the speech itself, and to the environment. So acoustic challenges to the listener are like, you have a hearing problem. Maybe you're not so good at the language that you're listening in. Maybe your processing of rapid information is, is impaired. That's what temporal processing means. So your ability to, um, to hear things when they're fast is affected. So those internal Deficits are the acoustic challenges to the listener, but there are also acoustic challenges to the speech. So if your person that is speaking has an unfamiliar accent, under articulation is a real fancy way of saying the person is mumbling, and an, or an unfamiliar speaker, those are also gonna be acoustic challenges. And finally, there are the acoustic challenges to the environment. So those are gonna be things like background noise, competing speakers, two people speaking at once, five people speaking at once, um, and whether an assistive device is being used. So those are going to be your environmental acoustic challenges. So what happens when we have more effort in listening? Maybe you're listening to this and you're saying, well, that's okay. People can work hard. There's nothing wrong with effort. I don't mind working a little harder than I, than I have to. Well, when we look at listening effort and when listening effort goes up, we see a couple of things. First of all, neuroimaging actually shows the brain actually working harder. So you can see that. Um, we also could see some physiologic changes. So when people are working really hard to listen, their pupils dilate, we see them sweating through a galvanic um, skin response. Um, we see the stress hormones go up. And behaviorally, we also see changes. We see that if they're listening really hard, they can't, their memory gets compromised. They can't answer as fast. Their response time slows down. And again, it's just more effort. All right, let's talk about, um, from a practical sense, how can we help? And I wanna talk about three things today. I wanna talk about um, an early memory loss program. I wanna talk about hearing aids, and I wanna talk about some listening strategies. So um, a early memory loss program is for patients who have a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment or dementia. They may still be working or driving, but the memory loss is starting to impact performance. Um, so maybe the patient, or maybe the patient doesn't realize and their family is noticing that the patient is forgetting to take medications, they're missing appointments, they have difficulty managing their finances. Um, and a, this type of program might have um, 12 sessions. I'm gonna talk about one program in specific, um, eight to 12 week program. It's gonna be highly customized because everybody's um, cognition is a little bit different. Everyone's needs are a little different. So we, it has to be patient and family centered. But the early memory loss program is gonna teach strategies which can be used to improve, um, to, to get better at the things, at the deficits. So it's gonna be things like using a calendar, um, bill pay, medication management, um, tasks, um, activities of daily living and cooking. So I'm gonna talk specifically about the program at JFK. I was working at JFK for 15 years before I came to Old Bridge and the um, speech pathology department there has a program for early memory loss. 
and they stimulate in the areas of memory, word finding, word fluency, and problem solving. Oops. And they have found that eight out of eight patients, this was their initial assessment, I think it's much bigger now, um, have shown improvement in word finding and communication skills um, as demonstrated on pre and post, post tests with the MOCA. Um, in order to participate with that program, um, you do need a prescription from your physician. Um, and if anyone needs more information, I can provide that. All right, let's talk about hearing aids. Hearing aids come in many different shapes and sizes. But first, do hearing aids even help? And the answer is yes. I think that sometimes hearing aids get a very bad rep, possibly because people have expectations of having their normal hearing restored. And in actuality, even the best fit hearing aid probably won't do that. But still, hearing aids can definitely make a difference. In this graph, we look at quality of life and by degree of hearing loss. And you can see that as the hearing loss um, gets into even just the mild range, there is an improvement of quality of life with hearing aids versus the lower line, which represents without hearing aids. Okay, and this is, I think, the research that has really taken, taken the news by storm. And that is hearing aids and cognitive decline. So here you see a graph. And the graph is showing the memory score and the age. And you see that as the person gets older, their memory is declining. And there's a very defined slope to that decline. Certain amount of, of memory decline as we age. But look what happens. We put hearing aids on. Here's where the patient got a hearing aid. We can see that the slope of the progression really changes. So is the cognition still declining? It is still declining but at a much slower rate. So even though time is still passing, we haven't continued at this steeper trajectory, we have less progression over time. But are hearing aids appropriate for patients with cognitive impairment? Let's talk about pros and cons. Problem is that patients with cognitive impairment have trouble doing new things. So giving them something new to master and learn how to work with can be very difficult. There are hearing aids today are extremely complex and sophisticated, and sometimes the accessories and the features can be difficult for patients. And these are patients that lose things, and hearing aids are expensive to lose them, so will they be lost? On the other hand, we have improved communication, increased socialization, which we know is super important, increased brain stimulation, also super important. So in general, it's gonna be the level of the dementia that is gonna predict the success with standard hearing aids. So a patient with a mild cognitive impairment will usually be successful with hearing aids. Maybe they're gonna need a little bit extra support, but they will be successful. When you get to the patients with severe cognitive impairment, they probably won't be able to use a standard hearing aid. Although sometimes I see that the patients who've been wearing them for years, they're already used to it and they do fine but they might be able to use some simple alternates. Definitely wanna choose the right hearing aid. So you wanna choose a hearing aid that's easy to insert, that is simple. There's even research that suggests that even the automatic features of the hearing aid should not be making so many changes for patients with cognitive impairment. When you worry about losing hearing aids, there are things called retention clips which basically tether the hearing aid to the patient so it's not as easily lost. And of course, the caregivers of the patient need to be engaged because they're going to take the primary role. Here's a little question I found online. Somebody asks, my mom, 86, recently moved to assisted living and lost her hearing aid the first week. She's 86, very hard of hearing, poor vision and dementia. I'm working on replacing her hearing aid and they say she needs two now because her hearing is so bad. Her dementia has worsened since the loss of the hearing aid. And of course, some of it could be the new assisted living environment. It's probably both. I'm worried she's gonna lose her new one. How can I prevent or reduce the chances of it being lost? She does wear it all the time except for sleeping and bathing. And I'm gonna say that's a really important thing because losers, which is what I call patients who lose their hearing aids, um, often tend to not wear their hearing aids consistently. 
because when you wear your hearing aids consistently, it's much harder to lose them. Think about people with glasses. People who wear glasses only as needed are constantly losing them. But people who don't step out of bed without their glasses do not lose their glasses because they always know where they are. So wearing it consistently is definitely a big part of the battle. Like I said, tethering the hearing aid is probably a good one. And ultimately for a patient like this, I would always suggest making sure that your hearing aid is insured because if you do lose it, you'll be able to replace it. So keep it under insurance. I think that one thing I definitely wanna talk about because it's made a lot of headlines is over-the-counter hearing aids and the difference between an over-the-counter hearing aid and a prescription hearing aid. So um, first of all, generally over-the-counter hearing aids by definition are being fit by the patients themselves. Whereas a prescription hearing aid is going to be fit by a licensed audiologist, hopefully, or hearing aid dispenser um, with lots of training um, in how to do that well. Price varies. So certainly over-the-counter hearing aids are gonna be less expensive overall, usually less than $1,000 for a pair. Whereas prescription hearing aids are gonna range pretty big range depending on the technology that you choose. When you look at what ages can be fit with over-the-counter hearing aids, they're only for adults. Whereas prescription hearing aids can be for all ages. Also the degree of hearing loss. Over-the-counter hearing aids are only for mild to moderate hearing losses. Remember that slide way back in the beginning where we said only 10% of patients with mild to moderate hearing loss have hearing aids? Great, let's get those patients in over-the-counter hearing devices so they can see that it makes a difference. Ultimately, if their hearing gets worse or once they see the difference, they may want a better hearing aid and then they could always change if they need to. Um, Prescription hearing aids have lots of options as far as style, whereas over-the-counter hearing aids are always one size fits some. And um, return policies are mandated for prescription hearing aids, but not for over-the-counter hearing aids. So buyer beware on that. And I think one of the very important um, aspects of fitting hearing aids is hearing aid verification. So hearing aids should always be fit and verified. And that means that a microphone is placed into the patient's ear with the hearing aid to measure the levels and to optimize the settings. And um, if that's not done as part of the hearing aid fitting, you really run the risk of having a hearing aid that is not fit well, and then is not as helpful. Um, again, we talked about the degree of hearing loss. And as far as the counseling and selection process, obviously you're gonna get a lot more when you get a prescription hearing aid. So those are the differences. And if you wanna know what you're paying the extra money for, that's what it is. There's also something even not quite an over-the-counter hearing aid called an amplifier. So an amplifier, unlike an over-the-counter hearing aid is not FDA approved. They're even lower cost than a traditional hearing aid and maybe even lower cost than an over-the-counter hearing aid. Um, and they can be ordered through the mail. They might be in a drugstore. There's very few adjustments that can be made. And there's also limited research on performance and safety. But sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes, you know, the patient is very demented and won't keep anything in their ears, but you can put an amplifier into their ears when the doctor comes to talk to them so that the doctor can have a conversation with them and just for that limited time and then take it off. So sometimes we do find that these can be very helpful tool. All right, I also wanna talk about listening strategies because there are a lot of strategies that can be used to optimize listening. So these are things that people with hearing loss wish that others understood. First of all, I can't hear you if you cover your mouth. So make sure that I can see your mouth when you're speaking. I also can't hear you well if you don't face me. So please turn around. I can't hear you if you mumble. I explained to patients that clear speech, it's the kind of speech that you use when you're giving a speech. A little bit slower, not distorting the words, but just a little bit slower and enunciating everything. And also speak one at a time. Your family is anything like mine that doesn't happen at family gatherings but that makes it really difficult for patients with hearing loss to understand. 
You also might want to get the listener's attention before starting the conversation. So don't just jump in with your question, but first get their attention and make sure they're listening. Also, giving people the topic of conversation can be really helpful. You want to use a normal volume. So you don't want to shout because shouting tends to distort the speech. And you also want to be very aware of background noise. So if it's noisy, um, you want to move. I often encourage my patients to use the magic words. The magic words are, I really want to hear what you have to say. Those are the magic words. And then they should be followed by, here's what you can do to help me. So I really want to hear what you have to say. Let's move away from the band. I really want to hear what you have to say. Can you say it again now that I'm paying attention? People are willing to help you when they know you want to listen. If you're the person who has the hearing loss, there's some things you can do as well. So first of all, wear your devices. Second of all, like I said, tell the speaker what tips will help you understand. Don't bluff. It's very tempting to try to guess or pretend you heard what was being said, but it can really get you in trouble. So better technique is to confirm what you heard, I think you said, and that will set a realistic goal for understanding. So that is the end of my talk. I have lots of references here. So again, thank you, Dr. Cater and all the participants. And again, please reach out with any questions to Dr. Cater. Thank you very much, Kaylin, for setting this up and happy Better Hearing and Speak Month to everybody.